All right. So the next question here you had, as an adjuster, how do you evaluate your own performances? Do you have any thoughts on this? Like, what do you think? Like, what have you done historically for yourself with your other, you know, your other types of claims work or other type of insurance work? Well, you know, like me, you know, I'm sort of a perfectionist, could be a flaw, could be a benefit, but you know, I don't want to just be average. I don't want to be mediocre. I want to know that I can go in there and I'm going to do a good job and I'm going to, you know, get my claim done early, not late, but I also want to know that I'm doing it, you know, efficiently and accurately. So how can you as an independent adjuster, I guess, evaluate your own progress to know where you could do better? Sure, sure. There's a couple ways. Um, there's, we'll say, three ways. There's metrics. Then there's um, manager feedback. I'm writing these down so I can stay on track with them. And then the last one will be your own tracking. Right. So the first one um, with metrics, the carriers 100% are tracking metrics on you. Right. So they they will QA your files, the quality assurance. Right. So say you turn in, you know, 20 claims that the most, all major carriers and, and most of the other ones have, if they're using independent adjusters, they have a quality assurance department. Well, if they're using, I mean, adjusters period, they'll, they'll QA their own staff adjusters as well, but they have a, uh, they'll do an audit of your claims, right? So basically the QA person, they may have 20 adjusters on the storm, and the QA person will take two claims from each of those people and go out, call the homeowners, ask them a few questions, let them know who they are, and then they'll go out and they'll reinspect the loss and they'll write it up by the book, right? So they'll do it just exactly the way the insurance company wants it done. And then they'll ask the insured a bunch more questions, including, you know, how was the, the insured dressed? Were they friendly? Um, you know, did they return your phone calls? Did they? Uh, did you offer them food or beer or, you know, tacos or whatever? And they said yes or no. Did they ask to use your restroom at the house? They ask like all, every possible question that they could think of in a customer service sort of aspect, right? Um, and then they, like I said, they do it, they reinspect the loss by the book, like down to the, you know, whatever their, their threshold is for accuracy. Some carriers will say, well, we want you to do the nearest three inches, um, or nearest inch or nearest half an inch. It's pretty much impossible to like go to like the nearest zero, like to have like exact, perfectly exact measurements on everything. So they, they give you a little bit of wiggle room on that. But they'll inspect everything, make sure that you got everything in the estimate that should be there based on the estimating guidelines and customary and reasonable construction practices. All right. So you have a technical score, right? Which is your, how you, well you did on your estimate, right? They'll look at your, at, They'll compare your estimate to, to their estimate, and they'll see if you were over or under, or like, you know, within a certain range of that. And then they will look at your file and look at the photos and look at the, the documentation and make sure that everything looks, it's readable and it's, it's a nice, it's a good file, right? It's a solid file based on what they want. And then they'll give you a score based on how well you did for that. Uh, as far as like, you know, if they wrote an estimate, and using the strict guidelines, and it was $15,000, $15, they may say, you know, as long as you're within 10% of that, you're going to get a pretty good score, either over or under, right? So $1,500, bucks, they, they, they're going to give you more grief and uh, grade you a lot harsher if you're under them than if you're over necessarily. Uh, yeah. If you're... If you're fifteen hundred dollars under, which is ten percent of fifteen thousand, that's fourteen thousand, or I'm sorry, thirteen thousand five hundred, which is kind of significant with regards to the homeowners trying to get the work done, right? So they they want to make sure that they the, the absolute minimum that you're at least like as much as they came up with, right? If you're over a little bit, if you're like if they had fifteen thousand and you're fifteen thousand four hundred, they may just kind of like say in the comments, you know, hey, listen, you know, you're we were super close, um, but you were over, and the thing that you were over on were these things. Just keep in mind that in the estimating guidelines, we have to do A, B, and C, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So they're going to give you feedback on that. So like, the very first thing is going to be metrics based on 
their QA's reinspection and their customer service survey that they do with the homeowner, asking you all those questions, right? So you get a lot, and you'll get access to those, right? Like your man, your eye for a manager will say, "Hey, you got some QA stuff? Check your email, right?" And you'll jump in there and look at it, and there'll be they may sometimes they'll the QA person will call you directly and say, "Hey, you got a few minutes? I want to go over the. I just looked at two or three of your claims." want to go over the stuff with you and let you know how you did and, you know, opportunities for improvement and your successes and, you know, whatever corporate talk they want to throw at you. Um, the second way is manager feedback. And that's a little bit more informal where you get on a storm or you get some claims, you know, you do maybe 20, 30, 50 claims, maybe a hundred claims. I'm going to go back to my manager and say, Hey, listen, um, I want to know um, what you think of how I'm doing. Um, and where you think I can improve, what you like about what I'm doing and where you think that I can improve, right? So where he's going to have um, some additional, he or she's going to have some additional feedback for you is going to be in your production, right? So he's also going to be like, um, especially if you're brand new, your manager probably will be looking at your files and then sending them to file review, right? So you may have like, maybe, and it, or maybe not, it just depends. If it's a smaller storm and you've got like good management, um, they may have a, be a, a bit more hand-holding with that, but it just all depends. But they're going to have, they may say, well, I haven't heard anything at all bad about it. And I'm looking at your numbers here and it looks like, you know, you're, you're closing the, enough claims a day. Um, you got these done in the right amount of time. So that's all I care about. Right. Or, you know, um, how are you going so fast? And I haven't really heard any complaints about your files. You're doing great. Or, Right. I, it looks like you're averaging closing about two claims a day, and, and uh, I feel like we, we need to kind of t take that up a level, right? So that's the kind of feedback I'm going to get from my manager is going to be mainly around sort of cycle time, which is for your production, which is basically how fast it takes you to close a given claim, right? So start to finish number of days. Usually cycle time is measured in days, from six to eight or nine days, Um and there's little milestones in there, right? They want first contact within 24 hours, and they want inspection within X number of days of that. They want the file inspect, written up and closed within 24 hours of inspection, so on and so forth. So those are the second set of metrics that you're going to pick up, and they're going to kind of more come from your IA firm team manager because the production is how everybody's making money on our side, right? And if you if you there's a baseline certainly. Brand spanking new, um, there's a ramp, right? So you can start with one claim a day for the first three days and then take a paper day and then do two a day for the first next three days, take a paper day and then ramp up from there. Um, if you do that, you, it's going to be, you're going to be a lot more successful than if you try to like scope six a day and then try to stay up all night long, writing them up, right? Which is just it's a recipe for disaster. And then the final piece is your own tracking, right? So for me, the way I would track how I was doing was, you know, I would I would ask my manager how my production was and how many, you know, I know what my production is, but I want to know compared to everybody else, right? I'm a little bit competitive. <laughs> so yeah. some people are perfectionists. I'm a little bit competitive. So I would be like, well, how am I doing compared to everybody else on the team? And after I, after I got the hang of this, I was usually number one or number two or three. I was in the top three. Um, and so I, the, the, everybody's got a speed limit, right? So I'm looking for, like, because I don't want to spend as much, any more time on site at, a, on a cat deployment that I absolutely have to, to make, the, to make the money that I want to make. Right. So I'm not just going to hang out in St. Louis doing one claim a day when I live, you know, 900 miles away. Um, I want to get in there and get the work done and get out, but I want to get as much out of it as possible. And that's where the, the volume piece comes in. So I'm going to be tracking how efficient am I, right? Where can I find places in my workflow to shave off 30 seconds or shave off four minutes, right? Because all that stuff by the end of the day starts to add up to enough time to do co to close another claim, right? So the way I would do it right. is I would um, basically just use my watch. I show up at the house, nine o'clock in the morning, right? As long as I'm on time, right? And I didn't like get a late start and I'm there at 920, um, which by the way, if that happens, the second you know you're going to be late, the second, even if it's like, I mean, if it's as long as it's within like business hours to call people, 
eight o'clock hits and you're like, Oh crap. I mean, traffic's crazy. There was a huge accident on 470 going around the city, right? I'm stuck here, right? I'm just going to be at least Google saying it's going to be at least an extra 20 minutes, right? I'm calling the homeowner immediately. And I'm saying, Hey, listen, I'm, I got jammed up on 470. I'm, I should be able to get there pretty close to nine o'clock, but Google's telling me it might be like 15 or 20 minutes or 25 minutes after that. So I just want to give you a heads up. Is that still going to work for you? Right. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no problem. I'll just have another extra, extra cup of coffee and read the paper and blah, blah, blah. Or 99% of the time, that's what they say. Thank you for calling. No, that's fine. We'll just be here. We'll be waiting for you when you get here. Right. Um, if it's going to be past that, and this is what I say, I'll say, if it's going to be any later than like 920, I'll call you and let you know how, how far out I am. Okay, great. That's awesome. That, that one thing right there is one of the biggest customer service hacks there is. Right. Um, so I always say I'm never late. So I show up at nine o'clock. We'll just say I made it on time. And um, so I've got it on my, my, my scope sheet, right? I'm sh- the, the appointment's at nine o'clock. So I don't have to like write down nine o'clock because I already did. Right. Get my ladder off, take my uh, risk photo, set my ladder up, knock on the door, introduce myself, a- answer, ask a few more questions, answer any questions that they have. And then I'm going to mark the time again. Right. I'm not trying to rush that part because this, it's, you know, having a customer service uh, where you're you're available and you're 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 not rushing, making them feel like they're being rushed through anything, um, is another kind of a critical thing, right? They don't want to feel like you're just kidding. It's just you're gonna jump in there really fast and then jump back out. Um, they want you, they want to feel like that you're being thorough, right? And then as soon as I'm done with that part, I get done. Okay, well, I want to go take a look at the house. You're welcome to tag along if you want to, uh, but it's just it's going to be kind of boring. I'm going to be up on the roof for a little while, um, and then I'll come back and knock on the door when I get done. And then, okay, great, that's no problem. I got I got to get on the call here in two minutes anyway, right? Then I'm going to write down that time, right? So nine oh nine or nine twelve or whatever that is, right? However long it took me to talk to the homeowner. And then say I'm starting my inspection on the roof. I'm going to scope the whole roof, take the photos, get the measurements and everything. And then I'm going to write, as soon as I'm getting ready to climb off the roof, I'm going to write down that time, right? So I, maybe we'll say it was, I got up there at 9.10 and it took me 12 minutes to do the roof. So 9.22, right? So I'm just tracking all this stuff and I'll do that for the, for the, whole, um, the whole property. And then, you know, by the end of it, it took me, 51 minutes to do this whole thing in and out, right? For, for whatever. And so I track that. You can get like, you know, if you're really a perfectionist, you can have a spreadsheet and you can track those there or just, you know, keep kind of a mental, as I usually just kind of, kind of kept, sort of kept a mental thing, tally running like, all right, I'm, I'm doing about 50 minutes, 50 to 60 minutes, you know, per claim. And the way that that, the reason why that works, especially on a cat, is because you're usually in neighborhoods where all the houses are pretty similar, if not exactly the same, right? So, you know, the the less time I spend doing stuff, and it's not so much that I'm like running around trying to just be super fast, it's that I'm going to, and this is how I came up with how I train adjusters, by the way. I'm going to find the most efficient way to get absolutely everything that I need off of a roof, for example, um, in, in the least amount of time, right? The way a lot of adjusters, the way most adjusters do this, and if you're one of these adjusters, give me a thumbs up in the comments, um, is they'll get up on the top of the ladder, they'll check the layers, they'll check the pitch, they'll get the shingle gauge on there, take those little pictures, and then they'll walk up the roof to the very top of the roof and stand there and do like, kind of spin around and take pictures of all the slopes. And then they'll say, ah, I think this storm came out of the West. So I'm going to, the, the backside of the house faces to the West. So I'm going to go back on the backside and look at that one for a little bit. And then I'll go over to the front side of the house and I'll just do everything like in just a total random willy nilly order. The photos are completely out of order, right? If, if I have a systematic way that I access the house every single time, I do it exactly the same way every single time without fail. I have much, much less chance of missing damage, which go back to my QA, right? The technical score that the carrier is going to give me. If I miss damage, I'm, I'm going to be under what, where my estimate needs to be. Um, I'm going to be a lot faster on the scope itself because it's going to be like, it's muscle memory. It's like driving a stick shift, right? I'm taking my overview shots, get my, you know, do my, do my 
damage scope, went to my test square, circled the hits, do my overview shots, get my overview shot of the test square, then my close-ups, roof accessories, then go to the next slope, right? Um, that's going to help me when I go to, to, to document this file um, and write the estimate because my photos are all in the exact same order every single time, and it's in an order that makes really, really good sense, not just to me, but to the, the file reviewer, the QA, to my manager, to anybody else that's got to pick the desk adjuster six or seven or eight or 12 months later when they got to, this file reopens for some reason, they're going to be able to quickly navigate through and understand what's happening with this file. They look at the estimate, the photos are there to back up what you write in the estimate, right? So they look at the estimate and they say, oh, he's he's got uh, you know 13 turtle vents on his estimate. The contractor says that there's 50 turtle vents, right? Well, let me take a, picture, take a look at the pictures, right? Goes and looks at the pictures. The entire roof is documented in the pictures. There's not one part of that roof that's not visible from some angle in the photos. 13, 13 turtle vents. Who knows where the contractor came up with the 50 turtle vents, right? It helps people out all the way down the line, makes it a lot faster for you to do all the things, right? So I'm going to track that. And so that's where my efficiencies are going to come in um, as far as um, – my own tracking and being faster in my performance, right? So, so you kind of to circle back to the, to the beginning of this, your performance is going to be based on your customer service metric, right? Um, the score that you get based on all the questions that they ask, right? Um, of the homeowner, and this is with the carrier. Um, it's going to be based on your technical accuracy, your technical skill and accuracy on your file, which is. How, well, how's your file look? Is it is it readable? Are you using spell check? You know, are your are your S, you got the right F nine notes in there? You got is your, are your line items the correct ones? Are you not underwriting, not missing damage? You got good photos and they, they back up what you say, so on and so forth, right? Um, and then my the final piece of my performance is going to be um, how fast I am, right? My volume because as as independent adjusters, I'm. The more volume I can do, the more successful I am. And it may not be, you know, I'm gonna hit a I'm gonna hit a theoretical speed limit per day where I'm like, all right, well, the most I can do um, a day reasonably inspect and write up and close that same day is gonna be, we'll say six or seven or whatever, you know, five. Pick a number, right? That's whatever it is the adjuster can do. And as you, the more experience you get, the more you can do a day, right? So very be your very first day ever on your first cat, you might be one, right? And I would, even if you think you can do more than that, I would still just do one because you're going to get a lot of reasons that I won't go into here. Um, so in order for me to, by the end of the year, have made what I want to make to hit my goal of my revenue goal, I have to do a lot of claims, right? So this is maybe like kind of like a bonus fourth metric, and that is, how likely are they to give you more claims, right? This is a measure of, of how well you're doing. Um, if they ask you to do cleanup, which is a, a big measure of how well you're doing because they kicked everybody else or most people, the rest of everybody else off there and they trust you to stick around and, and fix stuff, right? That's a, that's a big responsibility and it's a big thumbs up in your columns. It's major gold stars, right? Um, and then how likely are they, they to ask you back to subsequent storm events or claims, give you claims, period, right? Because it's by the end, at the end of the day, it's not like, well, I did a bunch of total losses or I did a bunch of huge, you know, 70 square, $2.5 million house, you know, roofs. And that's how I made all my money. It's, you're going to get every, you, you can't pick the kind of claims that you get. They're going to give you every single kind, right? Little fence claims, little teeny tiny houses, right? And great big houses, but a lot more smaller houses. And by the end of the year, how many total claims did you do? Right. And then you look at your, your total earnings and you can figure out from there, well, I did really well this year. I closed a lot of claims and this is, I was rewarded for it. As an adjuster, you need to know more than just how to read an HO3 policy and how to sketch a three-level house in Xactimate. You also need to know how to tell hail damage from wear and tear on composition shingles. The number one resource for damage identification books, trainings, and certifications it's Haig Education. Not only that, but they provide building inspection and desk adjuster trainings and certifications as well. These are the guys who make the classic Haig Damage ID books. 
that I used for years to educate myself, my insureds, and quite a few roof sales guys on what is damage that we can pay for and everything else. Looking at you, bird poop. Get a discount on all books, tools, certifications, and other trainings with the code ADJUSTERTV at checkout at hageeducation.com. You know what's boring? Insurance policies. You know what's not boring? More Adjuster TV vids right here.